I walked into the room and I said to one of you about your paper, this. You did really a, a great job on your paper. You'd probably be able to discern, to be able to tell that he means it. Say the same thing with a different tone. You really did a good job on your paper. It's dripping with sarcasm. Same sentence, you know that I'm being ironic and that I'm saying the opposite of what I mean. And I'm conveying that merely through the pitch and fluctuation of my voice. The problem with reading is that you don't have audio. You have to figure out the tone through other means. Now, at the beginning of the year, I made this big, long metaphor about paintings. And I said, back in middle school, you might have a class where you actually talk about what's in the painting. And I compared that to plot. And then I said, here in high school, we're going to do more than just talk about what's in the painting. We're going to, we're going to talk about the art of painting, how the painting was created. So, let me extend my metaphor to this painting over here. I didn't see you. If I told you this is a portrait of Kandinsky's father, this is his eye, this is his nose, there's his bald head. I don't know what he's doing here. He's eating a pheasant or something. <laughs> but if I told you that was the paint, a painting of Kandinsky, the artist's father, you could tell me something about Kandinsky's attitude towards his father just based on color, just based on the playful shapes. You'd have a sense that Kandinsky holds his father in some sort of playful reverence, the way the light's shining on him, that he's being held up to be maybe adored or to be studied in some sort of fascinating, complex way that's all the different colors. Conversely, if I took you over here, this painting is called New Descending a Staircase. And if you look closely at this painting, you can kind of see the hips the head, and the feet, and the stairs. This is by Duchamp. What is Duchamp's tone here? Well, what is Duchamp's attitude towards his creation? The fact that there are no facial features, the fact that it's rendered in browns and blacks, show that this nude is not even really a person. It's an idea of a person. It's an abstraction. And so his attitude towards his creation is sort of clinical, distant and a bit colder. Contrast with these two. Now, take over here to Francis Bacon. What's Francis Bacon's attitude, his tone towards his creation? Well, it's almost as though it's imprisoned with this black background, with this bulb with no shade on it. He's revealing him, and it's not very flattering. He's almost rendered in this grotesque, misshapen, distorted view. That's all wrapped up in his tone. Getting back to literature. Getting back to literature. I can't use colors, and I can't use my voice, but I can still express tone. Let's suppose I'm writing about soda. So this is the object that I'm writing about. I want to secretly, as a writer, convey this thought. Soda makes you weak. It makes you less than human. And people are addicted to it. Now, if I was writing an essay, I would just say, soda makes you weak. It makes you less than human. And people are addicted to it. But if I'm writing literature, I can't just come out and say that. I have to show you that. So what might I do? Maybe I have this kid who's always drinking soda. He has constant diarrhea. His teeth fall out. He turns into this junkie. His life goes down the toilet. And the attitude towards both the soda and the kid drinking it would be revealed through what? Through what the kid does, through what the kid says, through what happens to the kid. I reveal my attitude towards the subject, soda. By producing plot, by producing dialogue, by producing action. All right, now let's get to the book that we need to write about here. The Bridge of Salem's Thread. 
Who is the author? The author's name is Gordon Wilder. He's a studious little guy. Glasses, comb over, smoker. Sitting there at his typewriter. Old fashioned typewriter. And what's coming out of this typewriter is his creation. The bridge of St. Louis Ray. Right here. He invents the whole thing. There is no bridge, there is no marquisa, it's all his creation. His tone is up here. And it's a secret. He can't just come out and say, this is what I think about my creations. In Secret Life of Bees, the tone is not hidden. It's like a parade with somebody hitting symbols. It's too obvious. Here, because we're dealing with high literature, the tone is hidden. You have to be careful reader to unearth it. You have to be a literary anthropologist, archaeologist. You're slowly dusting away and looking for clues. He's going to have attitudes about the creation. What is the creation? The creation is at least two things. You got the big frame. This is the bridge of San Luis Rey sketched out in a very simple way. In this big frame, you have the big questions. God. Evils. And there's no direct relation to these smaller conflicts with these smaller conflicts to these big conflicts. Think about it. The Marquise's problem is not really related to why are we here? Why does God forbid evil? What's the meaning of life? It really isn't. The Marquise's conflicts are everyday real world conflicts. Why won't my daughter love me as much as I love her? Uncle Pio's conflicts really aren't tied up with these big questions. Esteban Emmanuel, there's a slight connection there when Esteban <coughs> is considering suicide and Captain Alvarado, that always makes me hungry because I'm thinking of avocado whenever I read it, gives the best anti-suicide speech ever because it's like three sentences and it's the truth. Life is hard. It doesn't last very long. Keep putting one foot in front of the other before you know it will be over. That's kind of like the meaning of life, but not really directly. So most of these guys, smaller conflicts, really are connected to this. So, this guy is going to have an attitude to both Brother Juniper and his big questions, and he's going to have an attitude towards the smaller conflicts, which are all his creation. Now, the biggest problem with tone is that people want to talk in cliches. His attitude towards the Marquisa is he hates her because he makes her a drunk. It's just not that simple. Whenever I end up writing about tone, and it's hard for me to write about tone, I am always forced to go to a thesaurus to get those fine distinctions. When you go to a thesaurus, you do not pull out words that you've never used before. What I do is I use the thesaurus to remind me of all the words that I know that I haven't been using. So, here's 
first one I just pulled up to Hussey. Now, Baggage, Odin, Minx, Wench, Jay, Wanton, Tart. Now, I would never use the word Houghton, H-A-Y-D-E-N, because I've never heard that word before. And I might be misusing it. But suppose you want to say that his attitude is hurtful. Well, here's some other adjectives. Damaging, harmful, injurious, noxious, prejudicial, baleful, mischievous. Mischievous is different than hurtful. These are direct synonyms. They're shades of meaning. One can be both mischievous and hurtful, I suppose, but there's a distinction there. You can be playful and mischievous. So let's take one example. What's his tone towards the Marquise, one of his creations? What's his attitude towards her? Well, a good place to look is page 33. Why don't you guys read page 33 and tell me, one, where the humor is, and two, take a stab at telling me what you think Thornton Wilder thinks about his creation of Marquise. Page 33. Page 33, I want to know where the humor is, and then I want to know what you think Gordon Wilder thinks about the Marquise. Giggling. Not really that funny. It's not really that funny? Yeah, you're right. So you got to be sympathetic and try to figure out where you think Floyd Wilder's trying to be funny. Anybody? Yes. Where is Thornton Wilder trying to be funny? On page 33, he tries to create a silly situation. Yes? Yes, let's get to the llama. Now, this is the scene. The Marquisa stumbles out into the area where there's a little fountain. There's a lot of invalids, people that are handicapped, their word, not mine, because they're there to take the waters because they think the waters will produce secure. And there's also a bunch of children around the town. Lord Wilder can't say, since it's not an essay, he's trying to do literature here, not secret by the piece. He can't say, the Marquise is a big, sloppy drunk who comes out, stumbles around, burps, he sits on the fountain, and the kids run away hard. He can't say that. What does he say instead? There's one word he uses to produce the first aha. Llama? No. No. What do the children do? Yes. Scared. Close. Yes. Alarmed. So, the scene in your mind's eye should be the Marquise that comes out. 
she sits down in the fountain next to all the little kids, unaware of what she's doing. A lot of the humor about the Marquises, things just go right over her head. She's so loaded. Part of it's the time period. We really don't think of sloppy, drunk people as funny anymore. So that's part of it. The kids stare at her and then run away, alarmed. It's kids for a reason, because kids are supposed to be innocents. And they, though, recognize, ooh, she's bad news. And then it's supposed to get funnier. Because after the kids run away, the Marquisa doesn't think she's alone. Who does she think she's with? Llamas? Nope. Who does she think she's with? Yes, name the back. Yes, you. No, man in the back. She doesn't think she's with llamas. She doesn't like to hang out with animals. Yes? Like the kids? Does she just like not even know they're there? No. Tells you in parentheses. Yes? Yes! She thinks that there's a lady with a fur coat and sunken eyes coming up to her and sort of standing right next to her. And then she thinks there's a bunch of other sisters coming over to talk to her. How do we know she thinks that? Because otherwise, this parenthetical right here, a lady with a long neck, sweet shallow eyes, burned down by the fur kid, too heavy for her, making her way delicately down the terminal staircase. Otherwise, that makes no sense. Why is that in there? It's what the Marquisa is thinking. So the Marquisa is literally so blind drunk, she can't see what's around her. She's so loaded, she thinks the llama is a person. Now, he put that in there for a reason. He could have shown you that she had a drinking problem by having her vomit in the fountain and being carried off by the police. That would have done it, and that would have had a whole different attitude, a whole different tone. How did he convey her drunkenness in a gentle, funny way, what he thought was funny? By having her do something fairly harmless. What? Scare a bunch of kids by just being weird. And then being so drunk that she thinks a llama is an actual person. So that's a case of plot and characterization conveying what sort of attitude towards the Marquis. How do you think he feels about the Marquis? That's sort of the thing you have to start thinking about. I know how he feels about Fina. He adores her. It's clear that the tone towards Fina is one of reverence. She's a tough little bugger in this tough situation. She makes the best of it. That's almost cliche. It's almost right there for you to see. Marquise is more difficult. He's amused by her. He's slightly sympathetic to her. He sees her as, yes, emotionally undeveloped and selfish. Childlike in that way. Almost kind of harmless. A social outcast that there's an undercurrent of sympathy for. Her crimes of sloth and laziness and selfishness do not radiate and harm a lot of people. If he really wanted to convey an attitude of chagrin, an attitude of distaste, he would have those character defects harm more people. The only person they reach out and really rub the wrong way, her daughter, kind of has a common. So her daughter has her own defects. And poor Pia, who could really use a mother, and her sloth and drunkenness prohibit her from doing that. 
but luckily the beat is tough enough to take. So her crimes are mostly victimless. And I've got to say, he does that on purpose because his attitude, hidden here, is shown to us through these smaller conflicts. All right. Now, you guys are going to be studying this just for a couple of minutes. Tone is kind of a slippery definition. It's not like science class. So I gave you three definitions. Take a few minutes now and read through these. Make a couple of questions. Think of a couple of questions to ask me about this. You can draw notes right on here. Maybe we'd have a quiz on this sometime. Give me a couple of minutes to read through that. Stay out. Oh my goodness. You want to stay out? What a good teacher. All right, so you should notice that each one of these definitions is a little different. The first one I take from the Princeton Handbook of Poetic Terms. This is like the Bible for literary terms. And it talks a lot about um, styles in a particular audience. Other recent critics have analogized tone in literature to a quality of speech. If you listen to a book on tape and it's read by the author, you might have a pretty good shot at discerning tone just by the sound of the speech. The way the voice fluctuates when he encounters or she encounters different characters. We don't have that advantage here. So the example I gave you at the beginning of class, sarcasm, is mentioned here. Thus, the tone of the speaker's voice may reveal information about his feelings, wishes, attitudes, beliefs. But that's just too locked up in speech to help us. So let's go to the next one. The application of the terms persona, tone, and voice varies greatly from one grade to another. It involves some of the most subtle and difficult concepts in philosophy and social psychology. Here's some of the things that you have to get right to get tone. You have to know about the self, personal identity, role-playing, sincerity, 
and when you get through postmodern works when you're a senior, Tony gets really tough. I teach a book to my seniors called Slaughterhouse Five. The book is written by Kurt Vonnegut. There's a character in the book called Kurt Vonnegut. It's a fictitious work. The character in the book, Kurt Vonnegut, really isn't a lot like the real Kurt Vonnegut. What is he doing there? And where's the tone? His attitude towards the guy who has his name in the book is one of ridicule and mocking. He calls that Kurt Vonnegut an old fart. Is he being sincere or not? That makes tone hard. You guys aren't going to have to deal with it. Let's go down to my definition. This is what I came up with when I was cutting my graphs. The author's attitude to the subject currently under consideration. So if we're reading about the Marquisa, it's Thornton Wilder's attitude towards the Marquisa. If we're reading about Hussey, it's Robert Newton Peck's attitude towards Hussey, which was pretty darn clear. It was like a gong, big slam. And that's why that book was so much easier to get tone. There weren't big words, there weren't contrived situations or lots of detail. Now, check out this next sentence. This is where you guys should be worried and I'm going to make you less worried. Remember, the author is usually not the same thing as the narrator, but in this book it is. So, the guy who says, I, at the beginning of the book, we're going to, for the sake of this paper, that's Thornton Wilder. There's got to be no distinction between the narrator and the author. So when that guy tells you something about his attitude, towards some of the things we've read, that's going to be tone. Right there, facing you, right in front of your face. And you're going to get some of that tonight. Unvarnished, unhidden tone. Now, typically you have to excavate past the narrator. And you need to do that here, too, because in the middle part of the book, the narrator is non-intrusive. It's at the beginning and the end of the book where the narrator is intrusive and pretty much tells you what his attitude and you can say he is, it's the Wilder is. It's in the middle of the book where the tone is much more uh, difficult to discern, like page 33. We must examine the tools that the author uses. So that analogy about colors and brushes and shapes and using knives and laying on heavy paint. We don't have that. Instead, we have setting, and dialogue, and description, and so forth. Metaphor, similes, symbols. And then we must hypothesize, and that's italicized because you cannot know what the tone is for certain. There's no way we can prove, so don't use that word in your paper, what the tone is. What you can do is give me an hypothesis and you can give me textual evidence that suggests you're right, but you can't prove it. You'd have to go dig up Fort Wilder, sit him here, and interview him to establish whether you are absolutely correct or not. And you're not going to be able to do that because he's not dead. All right. So, why don't you guys open up to what, was it 97 you should be on, right? Ninety-four. How about you the last night? Ninety-seven. Ninety-seven. Yeah. Now we're going to get back to the narrator here and Brother Juniper. You're going to get more characters. What? Why doesn't he just sum up what he's introduced? Because he's still trying to make a point, and we're back out to the big question. On this page here, these numbers have nothing to do with the people inside. It has nothing to do with these people. It's a whole other set of people who are in a Bridge of San Luis Rey-like situation. Instead of these people, instead of dying on a bridge, they die of the plague. It's swept into a little village. It killed half the people, and the other half of the people lived. 
This is another Brother Juniper experiment where he's like, aha! If I go in there and I study these people, I'll know why God does the things God does. I'm not terribly interested in whether Brother Juniper is successful or not. That's his plot. I want to know, what's the author's attitude towards Brother Juniper's experiment here? So just read right now and stop. Just read this page here, 97. Read 98. Get open to 99 where he tears up everything he just did. And then we'll read brains. Read it out again. Usefulness to other people, goodness, and whether you go to church a lot. And he realizes that my usefulness just about everybody is a 10 out of 10 because they're in such a low village. Everybody has to work. And then there's this one dude who's a really bad dude. He actually garners negative numbers. And everybody else is ranked. 
in the upshot of his experiment is ah! it just rips it up because what it proved was just the opposite of his hypothesis. His hypothesis was people that were good and went to church a lot would not have died. And the people that were bad and didn't go to church would have died. And so the hand of God could be seen going down into that village and go back to the metaphor at the beginning of the book, stroking the feather of the sparrow's wing, manipulating the, the black clay, giving it to you if you're a bad person, sparing you because you're a good person. And all along, God is managing this. But the experiment doesn't show that at all. It shows, if anything, just the opposite. Yeah. It seems like that. Now, that didn't really happen. That only happened to this guy's brain. This is all made up. Why did he make the situation that way? He did it to reveal his attitude towards Brother Juniper's project, if not Brother Juniper himself. And I don't think you can really separate the two. Well, he thinks it's foolhardy. He thinks it's a fool's errand. The narrator, i.e. Thornton Wilder, does not share Brother Juniper's desire, perhaps, or uh, his faith that you can figure out through math and science why God does the things God does. Does that mean the narrator's an atheist? No. The narrator just simply thinks that there's a gap between empirical science and math and faith. And you can't reconcile that gap. Brother Juniper is trying to do the impossible. It's like trying to find out how much a ghost weighs. A ghost, by definition, is immaterial. It's like trying to figure out how much a soul weighs or where a soul lives in your body. Some very serious scientists have done that way back in the 1500s. Descartes actually thought your soul lived in your pineal gland, which is up at the top of your brain. It didn't bother him that souls were immaterial and your brain was material. That bothers Stuart Walker. That bothers the author of the book. He sees that gap as something that cannot be reconciled. So his attitude towards Brother Juniper is foolish. He's, he's a good man on a foolish errand. Okay, look, we're going to do this fast. I'm going to deputize two or three of you to hand these things out. I'm going to call you up. You're going to come up with both of these. I'm going to write down the grades in my book for these, and then I'm going to tell you what your average is within two or three points using the computer in my head. Boom. Is that the end of the lecture?